All right, Psalm 13, not a very long psalm, but again, as I've been saying with all of these, lots of great doctrine, very simple concept uh, that we're going to be seeing today, and it's one that, that has, we have seen already and, and one that we're going to continue to see as we go through the book of Psalms. But um, there's one point in particular I'm going to be spending the most of my time on this evening. Let's start reading here again. I know we just read the chapter, but let's look down and read verses 1 and 2 again. The Bible says, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? You notice how many times the phrase just how long, how long, oh Lord, how long is this going to last? How long do I have to endure this? How long are these persecutions going to come? How long is my enemy going to keep beating me down, Lord? How long is this going to happen? How long do I have to wait? This is a, 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 a feeling, words that we probably said to God in our own lives at various times. When things get real rough, when things become challenging, Lord, how long do I have to go through with this? How long is the, the, the pain going to last? We could all connect with this type of an attitude. And notice he says, how long wilt thou forget me? He feels like God's not paying attention to him, that he's forgotten about him because he's going through a difficult time, because the enemies are, are attacking him, and he's starting to feel like, God, have you forgotten about me? How long are you going to forget about me, Lord? I'm over here. Look at me, God. I'm right here. And this is the feeling, I guess. Now, of course, we know, and we're gonna, as we get into this, we're going to see, we, he knows that God doesn't just forget about him. God is not forsaking David here. And if you're a born-again believer, God has not forsaken you either. But we have this feeling sometimes because we're locked into time. Our faith may be being tried and we're going through a difficult time and we just want it to stop. And we feel like, God, have you forgotten about me? He says, how long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily, where day after day after day, there's sadness, there's grief. It's not a good time. It's, it's just continually, he's lacking joy, he's, he's dealing with problems, and he's sorrowful. And we have a tendency, kids, sit down right now. And we have a tendency to think, you know, where is God? You know, there's so many problems. I, I feel like I've been dealing with these problems for so long, and I'm so sorrowful. How long is this going to continue, God? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? There's an important perspective, though, that we need to have with God that I think we could learn from this psalm because we've all been there. We've all had this type of an attitude of just kind of thinking, wow, how long is this going to last? And just, just pleading with God and praying to God, saying, Lord, you know, how long? I don't know how much more I could do with this. Day after day, the grief and the sorrow, I don't know how long I can do it. But we're going to learn this perspective. We understand that people do bad things to us, and this is the case in this psalm, that there's enemies of David that are, that are kind of bringing him down, and they appear to be lifted up, and he's brought down, and he's just basically saying, how long is this going to last? How long do I have to endure this sourness? But one thing that we have to remember, when people do bad things to us, we need to remember the long-suffering of the Lord. We love the long-suffering when it applies to us. We think about that. Think about the things where you've done wrong, where you haven't been right with God, when you've been on the wrong path, saved or unsaved, and you think about how long suffering has God been with you. Maybe you've been, been transgressing against somebody else. And they might be in the position that David was in, saying, how long is this going to last, O Lord? When God is being long-suffering for the other person's sake. Because God is merciful and long-suffering. And we're going to see those attributes uh, spelled out multi in multiple places. 
We need to remember the long suffering of the Lord regarding our own transgressions. Flip over, if you would, to Psalm 86. Psalm 86. You're in Psalm 12, or excuse me, 13. Just flip over to Psalm 86. We're going to start reading in verse number 12. The Bible says, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify thy name forevermore, for great is thy mercy toward me. And thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. He's, he's glorifying God. He's praising God for delivering him from hell, for, for saving his soul. Right? Let's keep reading here. Verse number 14. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul and have not set thee before them. So now he's done glorifying God for his salvation, and he's going to God and asking him for help against the proud. He's asking him for help against the people that are not godly, that have not put God before them. Verse number 15, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. We see these great attributes of our Lord full of compassion. He understands what we go through. He feels our pain. He's gracious. He gives us things we don't deserve. He's long-suffering. He doesn't just snap at the drop of a hat. He doesn't just turn around and just give us you know, a really uh, um, strong rebuke or, or, or um, a very severe correction when we do the smallest infraction. He's long-suffering over us and plenteous in mercy and truth. Verse number 16, O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thine handmaid. Show me a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed. Because thou, Lord, hast hope in me and comforted me. We see these attributes of God being full of compassion and gracious and long-suffering. And we see that being in connection, though, as is the case in Psalm 13. It's a very similar situation that the psalmist here is, is calling upon the Lord to have mercy upon him and to be long-suffering towards him, to be long-suffering in the sense that, hey, I know that I haven't always been good or right, but Lord, mine enemies are prevailing over me. Please help me. Please show mercy to me by doing justice and judgment upon them. But we also have to remember with other people who are attacking us, it's one thing if you have a reprobate that hates God, that is being your enemy and attacking you. We don't expect God to be long-suffering with them. And we're going to pray impregatory prayers. We're going to pray for their destruction. And at that point, you're going you're gonna to have this, how long, O oh Lord, as is going to be the case in the book of Revelation, just before the rapture, when the martyrs are appearing before the throne in heaven. And they're saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost not, not, not avenge our blood? When you have the God-haters that have taken the mark of the beast, that are reprobate, that are going around and killing the saints, and torturing them, and tormenting them. We have that same type of an attitude. But there's often times where we may have enemies where it's not from some God-hating reprobate, but that we are being persecuted, we are enduring, as was the case with the Apostle Paul. So turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Think about the Apostle Paul. And we have to remember that there are people like the Apostle Paul that exist in the world. And you may be on the receiving end of, well, he wasn't the Apostle Paul, he was Saul. You may be on the receiving end of, of what the actions of Saul of Tarsus was doing. What was Saul of Tarsus doing? He was going around and persecuting the church. He was hailing men and women, pretending to be on their side, and then casting them into prison. He was trying to find who were these Christians. Who are these people, these blasphemers, so he thought, worshiping Jesus Christ. 
He was persecuting, attacking, getting churches shut down, and going after them. You may experience something like that from a Saul of Tarsus and go, How long, O Lord? How long are you going to let our enemies prevail? But what we have to remember is that we serve a long-suffering God. God is long-suffering and full of mercy, and we thank God for that for ourselves, but we have to remember that He's also a long-suffering God for other people as well. And sometimes, yes, they're wrong. Of course, they shouldn't be doing those things. The apostle, you know, Saul of Tarsus shouldn't have been persecuting the church, but he did because he did it ignorantly in unbelief. And God show, has very much long-suffering towards people, and they can be sinning incredibly, but God will still be long-suffering. And sometimes we may feel like they're winning. They're not winning, but God is just being long-suffering and merciful towards them, and we need to be able to remember that so that way we don't get discouraged when it seems like nothing is happening, when it seems like nothing is being done. I do turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 15. The Bible says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So with all that the Apostle Paul did and all of his persecution of the church and everything that he was doing where other people would be saying, how long, O oh Lord, how long do you not step in? How long do you save us? We feel like we're being forgotten here. This Saul of Tarsus is coming in and he's persecuting us and he's causing us to flee in other cities and he's coming in and he's throwing people into prison. How long is this persecution going to last, O oh Lord? But we see that the Lord was long-suffering. He was allowing that persecution to happen. Not necessarily because of the people that were righteous, the people who were serving the Lord, but because of Saul of Tarsus. The Lord was showing his long-suffering on Saul because it wouldn't be much longer before Saul of Tarsus became Paul the Apostle, before he put his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he himself got saved. We see there in verse number 16, he says, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy. See, what God was doing is he's showing a point, he's proving a point that if I could obtain mercy, anyone can. You could see how bad the Apostle Paul was when he was Saul of Tarsus and all the persecution that he gave. And he says that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So that people don't think that they're just beyond redemption even when they have done things that were really bad as the Apostle Paul had done previously. And it demonstrates that the Lord has so much long suffering and allows things to happen because he doesn't want anyone to perish. That's what the Bible says in, for, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And of course, this is referring to, you know, in the end times, in the latter days, that God's not slack concerning his promise. Jesus Christ is coming back, even though people are going to be mocking that and ridiculing that, and there's going to be a lot of wickedness abounding, and people are just going to be making fun and mocking, saying, well, when is the Lord coming back? And he says, don't, don't confuse what's happening. And we need to make sure that we don't confuse sometimes what's happening in our lives when it feels like God's not stepping in. Well, just remember that maybe he's just being long-suffering towards someone who may be your enemy, but ultimately isn't a God-hater. Saul of Tarsus was not a God-hater. He did what he did ignorantly in unbelief, and God was long-suffering towards him. Why? Because he didn't want the apostle Paul to perish. He wanted Saul to get saved. And that's why, what, what, before Jesus Christ comes back, that he is going to be long-suffering and allowing so many things to happen before he actually does come back, because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
God so wants people to get saved that he allows things to continue until it crosses a line, until it crosses a point to where he has to step in. 2 Peter 3.15 says, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So it brings up the long-suffering of our Lord, and then he brings up the fact that Paul wrote the same thing unto them, which we already read in 1 Timothy chapter 1, how God is long-suffering. Peter is bringing up another reference to the long-suffering of the Lord that Paul wrote about. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers chapter 14. We're going to see a great example in the Old Testament of God's long-suffering. And there's a lot we can learn from this one story about Moses and the children of Israel and the Lord and how long-suffering the Lord really can be. We saw a great example with the Apostle Paul. We're going to see another great example here in Numbers chapter 14. We're going to start reading in verse number 11. The Bible reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. Now, what's really interesting right here, remember we're reading in Psalm 13 where David's saying, How long, O Lord? How long, God? How long are these people going to triumph over me? How long am I going to be sorrowful? How long? But now look who's speaking in, in Numbers 14, verse number 11. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses. So the Lord is the one speaking here. God is the one saying, how long, Moses, how long are these people going to provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me? I'm doing all of these miracles. I'm doing all this stuff for the people. How long is it going to be before they finally trust me? Before they finally believe? God can have that same question. How long is it going to be? What else do I have to do? And in this, in this instance, he's getting fed up because he's already been very long-suffering towards the children of Israel. He has done so much, yet they still refuse to believe. They still cause problems. So that's when he comes to this conclusion. Verse number two, he says, I will smite, or excuse me, verse number 12, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. He's finally getting fed up and saying, you know what, Moses? I've done so much for this people. How long is it going to be before they finally believe me? He says, I've had it. I'm going to destroy them and we're going to start all over with you. But then Moses intercedes. Look at verse number 13. This is all really interesting. Pay attention to this story. Verse number 13, And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou broughtest up this people and thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land, which he sware unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness." And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. I'm going to pause right here. So what Moses does is he's interceding for the children of Israel when God says he's going to destroy him. He says, hold on a second, Lord. And look at the tactic that he uses here. He says, hold on, Lord, because don't forget the Egyptians are going to hear this. Don't forget 
that you brought them out with a, mighty, with a mighty hand and with a strong arm and you led them out and you were a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night and that you led this people out and the people around us, they all know that you speak to us face to face. They know that you, Lord, are getting all this glory and honor for doing such miracles and for bringing the children of Israel out of the land God, they know all this, and if you go and destroy this people, Lord, it's going to bring the glory down. It's going to make, it, make you look weak, Lord. And he has this, this focus, this mindset on um, the enemy prevailing, right? And, and the focus being on God's glory, and that the things that God would do, Moses is looking out for, for the Lord and... Um, the appeal to the Lord's glory. Just like Mo, you know, Moses is bringing it up here, you know, people would end up blaspheming the name of the Lord if it would appear that the enemy prevailed, if it would appear that God wasn't able to, to, to bring the people into the promised land. You know, that, that's the way that Moses thought that it was going to be perceived by the world. And you know, we need to keep this mindset of giving all glory to the Lord just as Moses did, and standing up to make the glory of the Lord known. It should never be about how we are personally perceived in this world, but rather we should be focused on bringing honor unto the Lord. As it is with soul winning or with anything that we do, with all the works that we do, we are work never forget who you're working for. We're working for God. We're working for the Lord. You're not working for your own glory. You're not working for your own visibility among believers. You're not working for, to get these accolades and this public acclaim. We're not working for that. We're working to bring glory unto the Lord. We're working to magnify the name of Jesus Christ. We're working and trying to lead people to Christ and that these great works that are being done can be spoken of to the unbelieving world that there is a Lord in heaven, that there are things being done, that God's name will be glorified. That is why we do the things that we do. And when there are problems happening, that's a good appeal. Now, I'm going a little bit out of order in my notes, but... David was basically doing the same thing in Psalm 13 because he was worried about the people. In Psalm 13, verse number 3, the Bible says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemy say, verse number 4, Lest mine enemy say, I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. So David's appealing to the Lord, saying, oh, you know, Lord, unless they say this about me, and they rejoice at what would be a perceived failure of someone who's putting their trust and their faith in the Lord and giving God all the credit and giving God all the honor and the glory, that it's another reason to pray to God and say, God, don't let this happen so that your name isn't brought down. And then he brings up, so he says there, and you're in Numbers 14, so look at verse number 17. The Bible says, uh, Let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. So he goes then on to quote the Lord in his pleading for the children of Israel. One, he brings up the fact that, hey, the heathen are going to think that you're not really that powerful, that you're not really that glorious of a God. And then he also turns to going back to the word of the Lord. He says, don't forget, you know, God, let your power be great as you have already said. You've already spoken and said the Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. So Moses is just entreating the Lord, saying, God, please be, be even more long suffering as, as you've already spoken to us. Verse number 19 says, Pardon, I beseech thee the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And God has a greatness of mercy. We need to remember that. God's mercy extends so far that sometimes we may end up going through more difficult times. We may have sorrow. We may have people persecuting us even more because God is long-suffering. 
Because maybe those people who bring persecution might end up getting saved. And God is trying to give them a chance. We need to keep this in our minds and not just getting a really bad attitude or a bitter attitude towards the Lord. But remembering that can help to get through those times where we say, How long, O Lord? Verse number 20, And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron. So jump down to verse number 26. That was verse number 21. He says, As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Verse number 26 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. So we also need to remember that in all of God's long suffering and mercy, there's still a limit even with his own people. Even with us. That we cannot just have a really bad attitude of kind of abusing the long suffering and mercy of the Lord, of just saying, well, it's not that big of a deal that I'm sitting and doing all this other stuff because God's long suffering. He's not going to bring anything really bad upon me. That's a wicked attitude. And yes, he will. Because God, uh, God is very long suffering and merciful, but he only extends that so far. And in this situation, he was able to accomplish everything that he needed to accomplish. His glory, he's still exalted. He's still able to bring the children of Israel into the promised land. But he made sure that the people that were rebellious and stiff-necked and that were hard-hearted didn't make it in. That the people that were unbelieving didn't make it in. That those people still received and reaped what they've sown. David had the right attitude when facing persecution. Even though he wanted to know how long he would have to endure what he was going through, he never became bitter. He never had a bad attitude. Yes, he's asking the question, how long? But then he says in verse 3, we're gonna, I know we're going to reread this. Go back, if you would, to Psalm 13. We're going to finish up here. He said in verse number 3, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. You know, basically strengthen me, lighten my eyes. I don't want to die. Verse number four, lest mine enemies say I have prevailed against him and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. Verse number five, but I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. Notice he started off kind of being down. Right? Just, just how long, Lord? Things are bad. You know, I, I'm, I'm sad. There's a lot of things going on. The enemy's prevailing. But then he goes on to say, but I have trusted in thy mercy. And he, he's, in a way, he's reminding him of himself, hey, I'm trusting in you, God. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. Even through the difficult times, there's still reason to be joyful, to have comfort, to be satisfied with what's going on. Hey, my heart's going to rejoice in your salvation. And he also has faith knowing that God will bring him salvation. He's already saved in his soul. He already has eternal life. But I think what he's talking about here, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I think he's talking about knowing that God will step in, that God will hear his prayer, and that God will ultimately bring that physical salvation or that, that temporary salvation that he's looking for in this psalm, verse number six, I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. And this is the right attitude that we need to maintain every single day of our life. There is not one person in this room that cannot say that the Lord hath dealt bountifully with me. Bountifully means abundantly. That God has dealt really well with you. No matter what problems you have, no matter what you're going through, God has dealt bountifully with you. He's given you so much. People here have had such good food to eat and warm places to sleep and, and just so many luxuries. 
God has dealt bountifully with you. We need to recognize those things, even when things seem to be very difficult, even when we're really stressed out, even when you're being persecuted and attacked. Remember how bountifully the Lord has dealt with you so that you actually feel like singing. As David said, I'm going to sing unto the Lord. And when you're singing unto the Lord, that's not a fake, oh yeah, I'm, I'm happy because God's been blessing me so much. He means it in his heart. Because he's singing unto the Lord because he knows all the bounty that the Lord has given him. What great faith. What a great attitude. Even in the midst of everything going wrong, David recognizes all that the Lord has done enough to sing. He knows that God will defend him and save him. Very short psalm, only six verses. But we see... The progression from verses 1 and 2 of, of, of having this uncertainty, asking God, verses number 3 and 4, then just kind of establishing his faith and his trust in the Lord and just, just asking God to, to help him against these people that are trying to move him, they're trying to shake him. And then verses 5 and 6, just the assurance, hey, everything's going to be all right, and God, I'm still going to praise you. Praise ye the Lord. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for the encouragement that we can receive from your words. God, I pray that you please help us to be long-suffering and merciful. I pray that you please help us to understand and, and really to, to be able to take a step back when we suffer persecution, to be able to look at um, and, and to consider what all might be happening and, and the things that might be going on and, and your own long-suffering, not just to us, but to others and that you'd help us to have the, a similar type of grace that you have extended to people, and that we would um, not be too focused on ourselves, but to be able to focus and, and have a love for others the, the way that you've loved us, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.